Chapter Two of Alexander the Great. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver. Alexander the Great by Jacob Abbott. Chapter Two, Beginning of His Reign. Alexander was suddenly called upon to succeed his father on the Macedonian throne in the most unexpected manner, and in the midst of scenes of the greatest excitement and agitation. The circumstances were these. Philip had felt very desirous, before setting out upon his great expedition into Asia, to become reconciled to Alexander and Olympias. He wished for Alexander's cooperation in his plans, and then, besides, it would be dangerous to go away from his own dominions, with such a son left behind, in a state of resentment and hostility. So Philip sent kind and conciliatory messages to Olympias and Alexander, who had gone, it will be recollected, to Ephraeus, where her friends resided. The brother of Olympias was king of Ephraeus. He had been, at first, incensed at the indignity which had been put upon his sister by Philip's treatment of her. But Philip now tried to appease his anger also, by friendly negotiations and messages. At last he arranged a marriage between the king of Euphraeus and one of his own daughters, and this completed the reconciliation. Olympias and Alexander returned to Macedon, and great preparations were made for a very splendid wedding. Philip wished to make this wedding not merely the means of confirming his reconciliation, with his former wife and son, and establishing friendly relations with the king of Ephraeus, he also prized it as an occasion for paying marked and honourable attention to the princes and great generals of the other states of Greece. He consequently made his preparations on a very extended and sumptuous scale, and sent invitations to the influential and prominent men far and near. These great men, on the other hand, and all the other public authorities in the various Grecian states, sent compliments, congratulations, and presents to Philip, each seeming ambitious to contribute his share to the splendour of the celebration. They were not wholly disinterested in this, it is true. As Philip had been made commander-in-chief of the Grecian armies, which were about to undertake the conquest of Asia, and as, of course, his influence and power and all that related to that vast enterprise would be paramount and supreme, and as all were ambitious to have a large share in the glory of that expedition, and to participate, as much as possible, in the power and in the renown which seemed to be at Philip's disposal, all were, of course, very anxious to secure his favour. A short time before they were contending against him, but now since he had established his ascendancy, they all eagerly joined in the work of magnifying it, and making it illustrious. Nor could Philip justly complain of the hollowness and falseness of these professions of friendship. The compliments and favours which he offered to them were equally hollow and heartless. He wished to secure their favour as a means of aiding him up the steep path to fame and power, which he was attempting to climb. They wished for his, in order that he might, as he ascended himself, help them up with him. There was, however, the greatest appearance of cordial and devoted friendship. Some cities sent him presents of golden crowns, beautifully wrought and of high cost. Others dispatched embassies, expressing their good wishes for him, and their confidence in the success of his plans. Athens, the city which was the great seat of literature and science in Greece, sent a poem, in which the history of the expedition into Persia was given by anticipation. In this poem Philip was, of course, triumphantly successful in his enterprises. He conducted his armies in safety through the most dangerous passes and defiles, he fought glorious battles, gained magnificent victories, and possessed himself of all the treasures of Asiatic wealth and power. 
It ought to be said, however, in justice to that poet, that, in narrating these imaginary exploits, he had sufficient delicacy to represent Philip and the Persian monarch by fictitious names. The wedding was at length celebrated, in one of the cities of Macedon, with great pomp and splendour. There were games and shows and military and civic spectacles, of all kinds to amuse the thousands of spectators that assembled to witness them. In one of these spectacles they had a procession of statues of the gods. There were twelve of these statues, sculpted with great art, and they were borne along on elevated pedestals, with censers and incense and various ceremonies of homage, while vast multitudes of spectators lined the way. There was a thirteenth statue, more magnificent than the other twelve, which represented Philip himself in the character of a god. This was not, however, so impious as it would at first seem, for the gods whom the ancients worshipped were, in fact, only deification of old heroes and kings who had lived in early times, and had acquired a reputation for supernatural powers by the fame of their exploits, exaggerated in descending by tradition in superstitious times. The ignorant multitude accordingly, in those days, looked up to a living king with almost the same reverence and homage which they felt for their deified heroes. And these deified heroes furnished them with all the ideas they had of God. Making a monarch a god, therefore, was no very extravagant flattery. After the procession of the statues passed along, there came bodies of troops, with trumpets sounding and banners flying. The officers rode on horses, elegantly caparisoned, and prancing proudly. These troops escorted princes, ambassadors, generals, and great officers of state, all gorgeously decked in their robes and wearing their badges and insignia. At length King Philip himself appeared in the procession. He had arranged to have a large space left, in the middle of which he was to walk. This was done in order to make his position the more conspicuous, and to mark more strongly his own high distinction above all the other potentants present on the occasion. Guards proceeded and followed him, though at considerable distance, as has already been said. He was himself clothed with white robes, and his head was adorned with a splendid crown. The procession was moving toward a great theatre, where certain games and spectacles were to be exhibited. The statues of the gods were to be taken into the theatre, and placed in conspicuous positions there, in view of the assembly, and then the procession itself was to follow. All the statues had entered, except that of Philip, which was just at the door, and Philip himself was advancing in the midst of the space left for him, up the avenue by which the theatre was approached, when an occurrence took place by which the whole character of the scene, the destiny of Alexander, and the fate of fifty nations, was suddenly and totally changed. It was this. An officer of the guards, who had his position in the procession near the king, was seen advancing impetuously toward him, through the space which separated him from the rest, and, before the spectators had time even to wonder what he was going to do, he stabbed him to the heart. Philip fell down in the street and died. A scene of indescribable tumult and confusion ensued. The murderer was immediately cut to pieces by the other guards. They found, however, before he was dead, that it was Pausanias, a man of high standing and influence, a general officer of the guards. He had had horses provided, and other assistants ready, to enable him to make his escape, but he was cut down by the guards before he could avail himself of them. An officer of the state immediately hastened to Alexander, and announced to him his father's death, and his own ascension to the throne. An assembly of the leading councillors and statesmen were called, in a hasty and tumultuous manner, and Alexander was proclaimed king with prolonged and general acclamations. Alexander made a speech in reply. 
the great assembly looked upon his youthful form and face as he arose, and listened with intense interest to hear what he had to say. He was between nineteen and twenty years of age, but, though thus really a boy, he spoke with all the decision and confidence of an energetic man. He said that he should at once assume his father's position, and carry forward his plans. He hoped to do this so efficiently that everything would go directly onward, just as if his father had continued to live, and that the nation would find that the only change which had taken place was in the name of the king. The motive which induced Pausanias to murder Philip in this manner was never fully ascertained. There were various opinions about it. One was that it was an act of private revenge, occasioned by some neglect or injury, which Pausanias had received from Philip. Others thought that the murder was instigated by a party in the states of Greece, who were hostile to Philip, and unwilling that he should command the allied armies that were about to penetrate into Asia. Demosthenes, the celebrated orator, was Philip's great enemy among the Greeks. Many of his most powerful orations were made for the purpose of arousing his countrymen to resist his ambitious plans, and to curtail his power. These orations were called his Philippics, and from this origin has arisen the practice, which has prevailed ever since that day, of applying the term Philippics to denote, in general, any strongly denunciatory harangues. Now Demosthenes, it is said, who was at this time in Athens, announced the death of Philip in an Athenian assembly, before it was possible that the news could have been conveyed there. He accounted for his early possession of the intelligence, by saying it was communicated to him by some of the gods. Many persons have accordingly supposed that the plan of assassinating Philip was devised in Greece. That Demosthenes was a party to it, that Pausanias was the agent for carrying it into execution, and that Demosthenes was so confident of the success of the plot, and exulted so much in this certainty, that he could not resist the temptation of thus anticipating its announcement. There were other persons who thought that the Persians had plotted and accomplished this murder. Having induced Pausanias, to execute the deed by the promise of great rewards. As Pausanias himself, however, had been instantly killed, there was no opportunity of gaining any information from him on the motives of his conduct, even if he would have been disposed to impart any. At all events, Alexander found himself suddenly elevated to one of the most conspicuous positions in the whole political world. It was not simply that he succeeded to the throne of Macedon. Even this would have been a lofty position for so young a man. But Macedon was a very small part of the realm over which Philip had extended his power. The ascendancy which he had acquired over the whole Grecian Empire, and the vast arrangement he had made for the incursion into Asia, made Alexander the object of universal interest and attention. The question was, whether Alexander should attempt to take his father's place, in respect to all this general power, and undertake to sustain and carry on his vast projects, or whether he should content himself with ruling, in quiet, over his native country of Macedon. Most prudent persons would have advised a young prince, under such circumstances, to have decided upon the latter course, but Alexander had no idea of bounding his ambition by any such limits. He resolved to spring at once completely into his father's seat, and not only to possess himself of the whole of the power which his father had acquired, but to commence immediately the most energetic and vigorous efforts for a great extension of it. His first plan was to punish his father's murderers. He caused the circumstances of the case to be investigated, and the person suspected of having been connected with Bosanius in the plot to be tried. Although the designs and motives of the murderers could never be fully ascertained, 
still several persons were found guilty of participating in it, and were condemned to death and publicly executed. Alexander next decided not to make any changes in his father's appointments to the great officers of state, but to let all the departments of public affairs go on in the same hands as before. How sagacious a line of conduct was this! Most ardent and enthusiastic young men, in the circumstances in which he was placed, would have been elated and vain in their elevation, and would have replaced the old and well-tried servants of the father with personal favourites of their own age, inexperienced and incompetent, and as conceited as themselves. Alexander, however, made no such changes. He continued the old officers in command, endeavouring to have everything go on just as if his father had not died. There were two officers in particular, who were the ministers on whom Philip had mainly relied. Their names were Antipater and Parmenio. Antipater had charge of the civil, and Parmenio of military affairs. Parmenio was a very distinguished general. He was at this time nearly sixty years of age. Alexander had great confidence in his military powers, and felt a strong personal attachment for him. Parmenio entered into the young king's service with great readiness, and accompanied him through almost the whole of his career. It seemed strange to see men of such age, standing, and experience, obeying the orders of such a boy, but there was something in the genius, the power, and the enthusiasm of Alexander's character, which inspired ardour in all around him, and made every one eager to join his standard, and to aid in the execution of his plans. Macedon, as will be seen on the following map, was in the northern part of the country occupied by the Greeks, and the most powerful state of the confederacy, and all the great and influential cities were south of it. There was Athens, which was magnificently built, its splendid citadel, crowning a rocky hill in the centre of it. It was the great seat of literature, philosophy, and the arts, and was thus a centre of attraction for all the civilised world. There was Corinth, which was distinguished for the gaiety and pleasure which reigned there. All possible means of luxury and amusement were concentrated within its walls. The lovers of knowledge and of art, from all parts of the earth, flocked to Athens, while those in pursuit of pleasure, dissipation, and indulgence chose Corinth for their home. Corinth was beautifully situated on Isthmus, with prospects on the sea on either hand. It had been a famous city for a thousand years in Alexander's day. There was also Thebes. Thebes was farther north than Athens and Corinth. It was situated on an elevated plain, and had, like other ancient cities, a strong citadel, where there was at this time a Macedonian garrison, which Philip had placed there. Thebes was very wealthy and powerful. It had also been celebrated as the birthplace of many poets and philosophers, and other eminent men. Among these was Pindar, a very celebrated poet who had flourished one or two centuries before the time of Alexander. His descendants still lived in Thebes, and Alexander, some time after this, had occasion to confer upon them a very distinguished honour. There was Sparta also, called sometimes Lacedaemon. The inhabitants of this city were famed for their courage, hardihood, and physical strength, and for the energy with which they devoted themselves to the work of war. They were nearly all soldiers, and all the arrangements of the state and of society, and all the plans of education, were designed to promote military ambition and pride among the officers, and fierce and indomitable courage and endurance in the men. These cities, and many others, with the states which were attached to them, formed a large and flourishing and very powerful community, extending all over that part of Greece which lay south of Macedon. Philip, as has been already said, had established his own ascendancy over all this region, though it cost him many perplexing negotiations, and some hard-fought battles to do it. Alexander considered it somewhat uncertain, 
whether the people of all these states and cities would be disposed to transfer readily to so youthful a prince as he, the high commission which his father, a very powerful monarch and soldier, had exhorted from them with so much difficulty. What should he do in the case? Should he give up the expectation of it? Should he send ambassadors to them, presenting his claims to occupy his father's place? Or should he not act at all, but wait quietly at home in Macedon, until they should decide the question? Instead of doing either of these things, Alexander decided on the very bold step of setting out himself, at the head of an army, to march into southern Greece, for the purpose of presenting in person, and, if necessary, of enforcing his claim to the same post of honour and power which had been conferred upon his father. Considering all the circumstances of the case, this was perhaps one of the boldest and most decided steps of Alexander's whole career. Many of his Macedonian advisers counselled him not to make such an attempt, but Alexander would not listen to any such cautions. He collected his forces, and set forth at the head of them. Between Macedon and the southern states of Greece was a range of lofty and almost impassable mountains. These mountains extended through the whole interior of the country, and the main route leading into southern Greece passed around to the eastward of them, where they terminated in cliffs leaving a narrow passage between the cliffs and the sea. This pass was called the Pass of Thermopylae, and it was considered the key to Greece. There was a town named Anthelia near the pass, on the outward side. There was in those days a sort of general congress or assembly of the states of Greece, which was held from time to time, to decide questions and disputes, in which the different states were continually getting involved with each other. This assembly was called the Amphitionic Council, on account, as is said, of its having been established by a certain king named Amphiction. A meeting of this council was appointed to receive Alexander. It was to be held at Thermopylae, or rather at Anthelia, which was just without the pass and was the usual place at which the council assembled. This was because the pass was an intermediate position between the northern and southern portions of Greece, and thus was equally accessible from either. In proceeding to the southward, Alexander had first to pass through Thessaly, which was a very powerful state immediately south of Macedon. He met with some show of resistance at first, but not much. The country was impressed with the boldness and decision of character manifested in the taking of such a course by so young a man. Then, too, Alexander, so far as he became personally known, made a very favourable impression upon every one. His manly and athletic form, his frank and open manners, his spirit, his generosity, and a certain air of confidence, independence, and conscious superiority which were combined, as they always are in the case of true greatness, with an unaffected and unassuming modesty. These and other traits, which were obvious to all who saw him, in the person and character of Alexander, made every one his friend. Common men take pleasure in yielding, to the influence and ascendancy, of one whose spirit they see, and feel stands on a higher eminence and wields higher power than their own. They like a leader. It is true they must feel confidence of his superiority, but when this superiority stands out, so clearly and distinctly marked, combined too with all the graces and attractions of youth and manly beauty, as it was in the case of Alexander, the minds of men are brought very easily and rapidly under its sway. The Thessalians gave Alexander a very favourable reception. They expressed a cordial readiness to instate him in the position which his father had occupied. They joined their forces to his, and proceeded southward toward the pass of Thermopylae. Here the great council was held. Alexander took his place in it as a member. Of course, 
he must have been an object of universal interest and attention. The impression which he made here seems to have been very favourable. After this assembly separated, Alexander proceeded southward, accompanied by his own forces, and tended by the various princes and potentates of Greece, with their attendants and followers. The feelings of exultation and pleasure, with which the young king defiled through the pass of Thermopylae, thus attended, must have been exciting in the extreme. The pass of Thermopylae was a scene strongly associated with ideas of military glory and renown. It was here that, about a hundred and fifty years before, Leonidas, a Spartan general, with only three hundred soldiers, had attempted to withstand the pressure of an immense Persian force which was at that time invading Greece. He was one of the kings of Sparta, and he had the command not only of his three hundred Spartans, but also of all the allied forces of the Greeks that had been assembled to repel the Persian invasion. With the help of these allies he withstood the Persian forces for some time, and as the pass was so narrow between the cliffs and the sea, he was enabled to resist them successfully. At length, however, a strong detachment from the immense Persian army contrived to find their way over the mountains and around the pass, so as to establish themselves in a position from which they could come down upon the small Greek army in their rear. Leonidas, perceiving this, ordered all his allies from the other states of Greece to withdraw, leaving himself and his three hundred countrymen alone in the defile. He did not expect to repel his enemies, or to defend the pass. He knew that he must die, and all his brave followers with him, and that the torrent of invaders would pour down through the pass over their bodies. But he considered himself stationed there to defend the passage, and he would not desert his post. When the battle came on, he was the first to fall. The soldiers gathered around him, and defended his dead body as long as they could. At length, overpowered by the immense numbers of their foes, they were all killed but one man. He made his escape and returned to Sparta. A monument was erected on the spot with this inscription. Go, traveller, to Sparta, and say that we lie here, on the spot at which we were stationed to defend our country. Alexander passed through the defile. He advanced to the great city south of it, to Athens, to Thebes, and to Corinth. Another great assembly of all the monarchs and potentates of Greece was conceived in Corinth, and here Alexander attained the object of his ambition, in having the command of the great expedition into Asia conferred upon him. The impression which he made upon those with whom he came into connection by his personal qualities must have been favourable in the extreme. That such a youthful prince should be selected by so powerful a confederation of nations as their leader, in such an enterprise as they were about to engage in, indicates a most extraordinary power on his part of acquiring an ascendancy over the minds of men, and of impressing all with the sense of his commanding superiority. Alexander returned to Macedon from his expedition to the southward in triumph, and began at once to arrange the affairs of his kingdom, so as to be ready to enter, unembarrassed, upon the great career of conquest which he imagined was before him. End of chapter 2